This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043. His new book is My Effin' Life. He's on a very unique book tour, not at bookstores, but at big theaters like New York City's Beacon Theater, uh, where he has special surprise mystery guests interview him about the new book. He also reads chapters from the book. He also has a new TV show that we will talk about and get all the info on him right now at Rush.com. He is the world famous, the legendary Getty Lee from Rush. And uh, I'm holding up a copy of the book here, Getty. Uh, this photo is fantastic. And then the back photo, also you're in your, you're flying through the air with your bass guitar <laughs> in, in all of your rock and roll ecstasy fashion. But I want to ask you about this photo uh, on the front cover of the book. Uh, I believe this photo was taken way before cell phones and really sort of high-end cameras. Yeah, that was a photo taken of me when I was 17. It was taken by my girlfriend at the time, Nancy Young, who ended up marrying me many a few years, well, quite a few years later. Wow. Um, uh, and it's such a uh, good photo. We, yeah, I know. She was a good photographer. She had a little Pentax camera and she was okay. taking pictures. And um, we had only been dating for a few weeks and that was at a park uh, near her apartment, uh, um, not far from where I live today, actually. So it's I just it's been in my home forever. And I when I was looking for a photo for the cover, I thought I like that one because because uh, Nancy took it. Well done, Nancy. And, uh, you know, Paul Rudd was your surprise mystery guest slash moderator at the Beacon. For those that don't know, uh, tell us how you became friends with Paul Rudd. I mean, I know, but tell our listeners and viewers how that relationship sort of came together. Sure. Well, um, I guess I can't remember what year it is. I wrote about it in my book, but my memory is not that great <laughs> today. Um, a number of years ago, uh, I think it was 2003, something around there. Uh, we got contacted by um, the representative for director John Hamburg, who was doing a film. And the way the film was pitched to us, it was like, there's a film about uh, two guys who love the same band. And there's only one band that will work for this movie. And it's your band. And we please would like you to read the script and agree to be part of this because no, there's no plan B. There's no other band that has a fan base like your fan base. So, um, so we were in a zone where uh, we were trying to do things differently. You know, we had just come out of a, a long hiatus due to Neil's uh, unfortunate tragedies that uh, rocked right. his world. And um so we had a very casual upfront attitude and we sort of decided that things that we would normally say no to, we were going to say yes to. So we said, is this a comedy? And they said, yes. We said, okay, we'll do it. And the film of course is I love you, man. And we scheduled it between uh, two gigs we had in LA and we pulled up to the small theater they had rented for us to, to play our song. And <laughs> Paul and Jason Siegel were supposed to go through all these antics while we were performing. And the minute we walked in, there was just some kind of connection between Paul and Jason and the band. And we all got along so well. It was like a mutual appreciation society. And we were telling stories and, and in between takes. And Rashida, uh, who was also in the film, she was also wonderful and Everyone treated us so well, and they were, I think, you know, kind of fans of the music, and they were, I think, a little surprised we were so amenable to spend the day with them. But anyway, that's where our friendship began. And then I, it became known to me that he was very good friends with one of the violinists that was going to be on our uh, Clockwork Angels tour, uh, Johnny Dinklage. Um, and so uh, through Johnny, we started, you know, connecting more often and hanging out sometimes when we were in New York and Paul invited us to one of the premieres for the Ron Burgundy sequel. And then he came out on the road sometimes. And one one uh, one night he even came up on stage and conducted the uh, the orchestra behind us. 
And so we've had a lot of fun together doing all kinds of things. And when we were starting here in New York, I just thought, wouldn't it be lovely if he was around and maybe he would uh, consent to coming out and uh, working for me <laughs> for a night. And right. of course, he, he said yes immediately. I mean, he's he is just, you know, what you see is what you get with Paul. He's just the nicest human being you want to meet. Um, there is a story in the book that is really not well known. I, and I didn't know this, that at one point, Getty Lee was actually asked to leave, was kicked out, whatever you want to call it, uh, of the band Rush. Now, why did that happen? Well, why is a tough question <laughs> to answer for me, because I was the one that was kicked out. Um, but what happened was... Uh, they had just gotten this new manager. You know, John Rutsey was sort of the leader of that band of early Rush, really, I mean, we're talking really early Rush. Uh, and this fellow named Ray Daniels was um, just, you know, kind of trying to make a living being a booking agent. And he approached uh, us to, to be managed. Now, I knew nothing about that because he was talking to John. And I guess somewhere between John and him, they decided that they could use a better front man for some reason. So uh, I told the story last night. Um, I was walking to rehearsal one day and, and um, the keyboard player in the band at that time was actually uh, the brother of my now wife, Nancy Young. So he was in the band at the time. And they tasked him. He was the nicest, most innocent guy. And they gave him the job to break the news to me and to, to basically lie to me and say the band had broken up. And so I ran into him on the way and he was shuffling his feet and, and telling me the band had broken up. And I was just kind of stunned by that. And uh, anyway, the next day I called around musicians and started a new band and they became a band called Hadrian. Uh, that did a total of two gigs before they completely fell apart because they were really bad. And <laughs> then a number of months later, I got a call from John Rutsey uh, asking me to come back into the band. And of course, I said yes, because I really missed Alex. I missed playing with Alex. And, you know, he's been my BFF from the time I was, you know, 16. So uh, that was a good decision, I think. <laughs> I think so too. Um, at, but there was a point during that, you know, sort of hiatus, if you want to call it that, when you were not in the band, um, there was one night where on the same night, a legendary artist was playing that you had bought tickets to see. On the same night, this other band, what was it called? They called Hadrian. themselves Hadrian. 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 Yeah. Uh, uh, so you bought tickets to this incredible artist, but instead you decided to not go to that show that you spent money on to buy tickets. And instead you went to see Hadrian. Um, who was the band that you did not see that night? Well, it's a terrible confession, but the band I did not go to see was the Jimi Hendrix experience. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> the Toronto? It was Toronto, right? In Toronto, yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, I think he had been arrested coming into the country for drug possession. But the show did go on. and uh, uh, But I wasn't there. And I, I just assumed, you know, he'll come back sometime and I'll see him then. But unfortunately for the world and, and uh, you know, he passed away not, not long after that. But I went to see this crappy version of Rush that they had put together called themselves Hadrian and <laughs> it was painful to watch because they weren't very good and uh, it didn't make me feel any better in fact it I think it made me feel worse that they replaced me with someone that couldn't really handle the gig and uh, it wasn't long before they were they just fell apart so um, that's, you I think that's called karma <laughs> that is called karma it's a big time karma move there um, you're a confessed hoarder. In fact, I read that you kept every single hotel or motel room key from Russia's first tour. Yes, I did. I was desperate to find it. I don't know what happened to them. I'm sure my wife threw them out at some point. But... Right, yeah. 
Um, and I never thought I would. I never thought I'd get back to you know Evansville, Indiana again. So I kept all the keys. Right, yeah, I got. I bet those motel room co- keys were kind of cool back then. They were probably like shaped like evergreen trees or something. You well, know, they were like, big and clunky, big plastic. They were mostly like the cheapest hotels you could stay in at the time. Were like Ramada yeah. or Holiday Inns or things like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big bag, and I really want to take a picture of them for my book, but I can't find them anywhere. So, oh man, uh, you've also said it was easier for you to remember things that happened to you and the band in the early days than it was, say, you know, mid to late '90s or like the 2000s. Yeah, I think what happens is um, it's not that they're easier to remember; it's harder to differentiate between gigs that are current you know you you almost have too much information at your disposal too many photographs too many gig uh, details in your mind and it's hard to separate them whereas the outstanding gigs from 30 40 years ago seem somehow more uh, cemented in your memory banks because i was young we were all young because so many of them were thrilling Uh, A lot of first time adventures playing with other bands, opening for, you know, bands you never thought you'd ever be in that position. And uh, I think you kept those memories in a a more sacred place. And looking back at them, they're more fun to talk about because they were so goofy and there are so many kind of crazy experiences we had in those early days, just learning how to be a rock band and trying to be successful. So uh, it was really a, like a detective game, you know, trying to put the pieces and the clues together. And fortunately for me, being the hoarder that I am, I kept so many uh, bits of memorabilia and uh, um, photographs. I have all con- I was always taking photographs with my little crappy Instamatic camera. And, and so I do have a lot of great visual things to spark my memory. Um, Brian Johnson of ACDC, he put out a book and he said the best way for him to remember things was to look at each car that he bought every year. He's been in ACDC. <laughs> he's, he's a car guy. So he's, you know, just full on. And that's how he remembered things. Oh yeah. I was in that city and I bought that car and then, uh, Hey, whatever it takes. Right. I mean, hey, yeah, whatever it takes, you know, it was really a challenge. To, to get it right. And I had to cross-reference a lot of sources. And one of my sources was, of course, my buddy Alex. I would call him up and say, hey, man, do you remember that gig where this happened and that happened? He said, yeah, but I remember totally different than you remember. Oh, yes, that's oh, right. Really? That's what, yeah, yeah, you got to interview your friends and they they have like a totally different like version of what happened that night or whatever, you know? And that's when I realized that our memories are, are they're, colored by our emotions of course so what happened at a particular gig what emotional thing you were going through whether it was a happy gig or a sad gig depends on how you remember it so it's different for every person and that happens not only with gigs but certain events like uh, i got a letter recently from from uh, an old friend of mine who i talk about in my earliest years uh, who was who was the guy responsible for giving me the name Getty. And he remembers the conversation about my mom and my name in a very different way than I did. And so uh, how do you reconcile that, you know? And he remembered other facts about the earliest years that were quite different from what I recalled. But, you know, and I call Alex up, said, you remember this way? And so anytime he agreed with my memory, I went with that. (laughs) (laughs) Um. Early on, you guys did a tour with Kiss as a support act. And there is a great quote, which I'm sure you know, uh, from Gene Simmons, where he says, quote, every night after a show, the girls would line up. And my God, you could even be an ugly guy like me and hook up. And none of the Rush guys ever did. I just never understood it. What did they do when they went back to their hotel room? Well, we were smoking a hell of a lot of pot. That's what we were doing (laughs) and watching the Twilight Zone uh, after doing so. So, uh, yeah, we were laughing. We were having a ball. Uh, um, And, you know, there was no competing with the kiss after show thing. I mean, how could you? I mean, you can't compete with that. We were like 
new newborns you know we were babes we didn't know anything about the industry we didn't know anything about the touring world and we would just leave our door open be smoking joints and sticking our head out to look at what was going on and you'd often see the guys in full uh makeup uh they come home from the gig in full makeup because otherwise how would the 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 chicks know that they were in kiss right yeah i'm this guy i'm that guy yeah yeah, yeah i'm gene simmons yeah right uh but yeah <laughs> so it was it was a circus every night and it was really fun to watch um Tell us about the Taylor Hawkins tribute last year, because um, it looked and sounded amazing. What 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 are your sort of fondest memories about that? Oh, that was a very special, very special gig for a lot of reasons. Obviously, it was sad because of uh, losing Taylor and how much he meant, of course, to Dave. Dave Grohl and him were besties. You know, that's like uh, me and Alex, you know, they were they were besties and that hit Dave pretty hard, but Dave is like a superhuman. And uh, he called me out of the blue. You know, I had written to him after Taylor passed away and gave, you know, extended my sympathies, of course. Uh, and Taylor had just sent me a note like two weeks before he passed away, just checking in on me. And that was really the kind of guy Taylor was, you know, uh, it was always bugging me to get out get out back on stage and, and play uh so anyway uh so dave calls me and he said look i'm gonna do this um this tribute and of course you know you were one of taylor's favorite bands so uh would you consider reforming for that show and i said yes immediately of course and he was very considerate and he said look i don't think you should play with one drummer because then everyone's going to say that's the new rush so play with at least two <laughs> yeah so i said okay i'll i'll make you a deal we'll we'll play with two drummers but you have to be one of them and of course he was thrilled to do it uh so uh then came the gig and but even before that you know alex and i were like a fish out of water we hadn't played in seven years on stage i hadn't played those songs in seven years Aside from the one cameo we did on the South Park uh, 25th Right, Cent. yeah. Yeah. So he's so amazing and generous. And he grabbed Omar Hakim, hopped on a plane and flew to Toronto. Whoa. And we had organized these rehearsals in Toronto. And we did two days of rehearsals just to make us comfortable, just to make us feel like this is a doable thing. And then when we got to London he had set everybody up in this hotel room and really it was like summer camp for rock musicians everybody communed with everybody and it's the only gig i think i've ever done that had multiple musicians and multiple big name musicians that had no sense of competitiveness there was no ego everybody was so welcoming and supportive to every other musician that it was really one of the greatest memories of my entire life and and the show and of course dave superman played with almost every band and he was sleeping three hours a night wow but we got to connect with all these people we hadn't met i got to meet paul mccartney and he was so lovely and inspiring and encouraging after the gig we had a little group of us uh, josh homie alex me and Dave would come in every once in a while so I could pour him a glass of wine and and Will Forte was there and Luke Spiller um, and Paul came and sat with us and um, you know he had loved our set which meant a lot to hear from someone of that stature but he was insistent that we had to go out on the road and <laughs> he was making a plea and he I remember him saying to me it, you know what Ringo says? It's what we do. And uh, <laughs> I said, okay. Pretty good can... liver puddly in there getting. Yeah, yeah. I said, you convince <laughs> Alex that we're in. So he, he went to work on Alex. But so for all the sadness of what we were celebrating, it was a beautiful event and one that really helped Alex and I realize that. Uh, these were our songs. We have nothing to be ashamed of to go out and play them with another drummer or if we would ever decide to do that again. 
And that was great to reclaim sort of ownership of our legacy in that regard. So, and I think Dave understood all that. And that's what makes me particularly grateful to him. Uh, we're speaking with Getty Lee. His new book is My F and Life. And we're going to talk about his TV show as well. But this is a, like another book in itself, Getty, it, that both of your parents, I think I have this right, they met while in the concentration camps. That's correct. Yeah. And they yeah. both survived. That, that, that's, a, that's a movie in itself right there. You know, they fell in love in the work camps. You see, when they uh, when the Germans first came into, uh, I should say the Nazis, uh, when they first marched into Poland uh, and they ghettoized the Jewish population, and they used them to construct the work camps. And, and my mom's town was a, a, had a munitions factory in it already and a, a, a wood, a lumber yard. And so it was a prime uh, source of material for the war effort. And that's why so many people from that town did survive. Uh, but they met in those work camps and they kind of had a crush on each other. And, and my dad kept up communicating with her even when they were shipped to Auschwitz and they were in Auschwitz for a number of months and he was in the men's camp and she was in the women's camp and my dad would do things like send her uh, shoes uh, that he would bribe a guard to carry shoes to her and little things like that so that they they had fallen in love which in the most unlikeliest of, of hell holes and so after the war of course the first thing on his mind was to see which parts of his family were still alive. But more importantly, he wanted to know if my mom was still alive. And of course, he did discover that. And then he, you know, hitchhiked across Germany. Uh, he had been liberated in Dachau. And my mother had been liberated in Bergen-Belsen, which is a few hundred miles away. So he thumbed his way across Germany and walked into the camp uh, yeah, and the rest is history. And of course, in short order, they got married right in that camp. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Get Getty Lee is with us. We're speaking about his new book, My F in Life, and also his new TV show that we're, we're going to talk to uh, talk about in a second. Um, Getty, you know, Keith Richards talks about his love of Charlie Watts. Jimmy Page, of course, and Robert Plant say the same kinds of things about John Bonham. Pete Townsend says the same things about Keith Moon. These drummers were sort of perfect for those bands. They might not have been perfect for other bands, but they were perfect for those bands. And I'm just thinking, you know, as a sort of frustrated musician, guitar player myself, when you have a drummer sitting behind you that feels like a freight train about to roll <laughs> over you uh as part of your rhythm section in rush i mean that uh, you know and, and you tell the story about the audition the audition of neil i mean that just had to be it, it, nobody gets a drummer like that you know no it was a, it was a one in a zillion you know that he walked into our lives that day was was just unbelievable you know we had tried to contact another drummer that we knew that played for another band that was very good. And he had kind of agreed to be in our band for about a day. And then uh, his bandmates convinced him not to, to leave. And so uh, then we had these, these auditions and uh, four drummers showed up, two of which who, names I can't recall at all. I'm ashamed to say, but uh, the third guy who came in was this goofy looking dude, this lanky, short haired guy, not wearing a shirt, pulled up in a Ford Pinto. He had Pinto uh, classic. <laughs> yeah, he had drums sticking out the back. They were all in green garbage bags. Garbage uh, bags. I love he it. Set, he set them up and uh, he sat, he was a big guy, you know, six foot two, sat behind the throne was playing these two uh 18 inch bass drum very small bass drums that sounded and when he started playing neil peer triplets that sounded like machine gun fire and oh my god I, I knew from the minute he started playing those i said i am just not letting this guy out of my sight wow and of course alex was mad at me because he he had you know he was giving me the side eye and he, pouting because 
we had promised to listen to every drummer before we made a decision, but come on. When Neil Peart walks into the room, you hire the guy. <laughs> Game over. Game yeah. over. You hire the guy. Jeez. Uh, hey, tell us about um, our bass players, Human 2. And now this is streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Tell us about this show, because I, I saw a little clip of it, but uh, it looks amazing and fun, too. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, so aside from doing my memoir during the lockdown, um, I'd been approached by Sam Dunn from Banger Films to see if I wanted to do a documentary based on... Um, my first book, the big, beautiful book of bass. Right. Yeah. Sam is a bass player. Of course, only bass players would come up with an idea like that. So uh, <laughs> he said, what do you think? And we threw some ideas around and we really couldn't hit on the right thing. And then it dawned on me that the interviews I had done for that book were so interesting because not only did I learn about um, these bass players and their love of their instrument and some of the vintage instruments they played. But I got a short glimpse into their lives off stage, and many of them were multifaceted and, you know, sort of fascinating individuals, especially Bill Wyman, who blew my mind because, you know, here's a guy who invented his own metal detector because he's got small hands. And, uh, <laughs> You know, he had discovered relics with him and his daughter had discovered relics that are now in the British Museum. He's written nine books. Uh, he's a butterfly photographer. He's a cricketer. So it dawned on me that wouldn't it be fun to set out a, a goal to try to prove that bass players are actually human too. They're not just those those characters that you see hanging around the drum kit, skulking in the shadows, checking out the girls in the first few rows. They, they, some of them have more going on. And so that was became the premise of the book. And much to my surprise, yeah, Paramount Plus loved it. So uh, they allowed us to go and uh, shoot a bunch of episodes. And I was a bit hesitant once it even got purchased and funded i was a bit hesitant because i had to do your job i had to be on the other side of the camera but um in the end i had so much fun i learned so many things and you know went to these homes and it it sort of is like a travelogue you know it's it's like part travel show taking me to places i really hadn't been before and learning so much about all the various communities that these bass players are a vital part of. And that was really gratifying. So I hope fans love it. And uh, uh, I, I hope they have as much fun watching it as we had making it. And I, I think they will. It's, it's pretty charming. Uh, you've got Les uh, from Primus in there, Robert from Metallica, and a couple other guys too, I think, right? I got Melissa Oftamar, who's really uh, lovely and fascinating uh person and uh chris novoselic uh wow. yeah he's just awesome dude and what a what a life he lives just fantastic um there are actually some previously unheard getty lee songs that are in the audiobook version okay. of my f and life yes and we're going to re release them i think this week on radio as well oh good uh, yeah, uh, we found uh, during the course of writing the book, my co-writer on My Favorite Headache came across these demos that we had sort of forgotten about. And there are two songs. I talk about them in the book a little bit. One of them is a song called Gone that I had written just after Neil's daughter, Selena, had passed away tragically in that car accident. And... Um, you know, when you lose somebody, you relive a lot of your other losses. And I was, you know, thinking about how how does one deal with a sudden disappearance of someone from your life, especially a daughter? Um, so I wrote this song with Ben. It was the first song we wrote for My Favorite Headache. And we demoed it, but it just felt, it was beautiful, but it was I felt it was too raw. It was too close to the bone. I didn't think it was appropriate to release it, you know, out of respect for Neil and the way he was. I didn't feel it was right. So we shelved it. 
And the other one was a song that we had left sort of incomplete, but most of it had been recorded. It was called I Am, You Are. And it was about relationships. And it's about me in the midst of a difficult conversation with, you know, my wife, which happened more than once in my life, you know. Uh, so I think the personal nature of that made it also maybe something I wasn't prepared to follow through with. But hearing them last year, when I discovered them again, it was like, wow, I'm, I was amazed how they stood up. And so I asked my friend and part-time Rush producer, David Bottrell, to come in and have a listen to him. And he came over and sat down and, well, he loved them and he loved how raw they were and he loved how honest he thought the vocals were uh, very different from the other things that are on the album. And he just said, leave it with me. Let me play with them and see if I can clean them up, you know, without changing too much because he didn't want to lose all the guitars original. My vocals were original. They were done almost 24 years ago. Uh, we put new drums on it. We got a friend of mine to play drums on one song. And then we called Benny up, uh, Ben Mink, and said, because David thought the song really needed a violin solo. And Ben is so amazing. He's like the Jeff Beck of the violin. And he just pulled off a corker of a solo. Anyway, um, he mixed them and sent them to me. And I was really shocked. And it really lifted me up and made me remember how much fun it is to make records. And so uh, they're on the audiobook and they will be released to, to radio and this week. Uh, and I hope people get a kick out of them. I call them the lost demos. And because uh, that's what they were. Really, I had forgotten completely about them. Getty Lee is his name. His new book is My F and Life. Everyone go out and buy it. It is fantastic. And stream the new show on Paramount Plus. Uh, do I have the name right? Are bass players human too? Yes. Getty Lee asks. Are Getty Lee asks, are bass players human too? I love and get all the info right now on all of this at rush.com. Getty Lee, thank you so much. Hey, Jonathan, great to be here. Great to talk to you again. This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043.